David, shepherd, psalmist, and king, after God's heart. That's really our pursuit, right? After God's heart, that we would pursue after him, and that we would be after following after his heart, and that we would be shaped, formed, fashioned in the image of his son. We're looking at Jesus. We're picking it up from where we were last time in Psalm 122. There were some amongst us that were not happy with the fact that we did not go past <laughs> verse number five, that we left it there. The cliffhanger was, uh, was profound. But here we are. Anybody fall off the cliff? We're all good? <laughs> all right. Let's pick it up in verse 6, go down to verse 9. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. You remember last week that we had seen in verse 4 and 5, these three words, that was, that appeared three times. Do you remember it? Shem. Shem and Shem. Shem. Yeah. Shem. 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 There you go. So Shem. we got a bunch of Hebrew uh, bilingualists here. Excellent. Okay. So uh, remember that it was centered around Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the focus in verse 3. And then the emphasis here was on giving thanks to the Lord um, or to the name of the Lord. Then it's leading us into verse number 6. It's Verse 6 is one that we hear on its own a lot, isn't it? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, but it's, and it's usually just that portion of verse 6 that is looked at or, or that is quoted. But it continues on and says, may, though, may they be secure who love you. Uh, another translation would have it as, what, what, what do other translations say? May those who love you be secure. May those who love you be secure. Others may say, may those who love you prosper. The idea, though, uh, foremost is a security, steadfastness. What does it mean here? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Think in context of what Jerusalem is representing for the people at this time. The, this is the third in the songs of the songs of ascent. So, what was the what was the uh, usage of these songs? When were they usually recited or sung? On the way to the temple, and remember the. Pardon me? And Jerusalem. And Jerusalem. Yeah, excuse my back here for a moment while I see if I can get my tongue to flow a little better. Not the back. Uh, no, that's, <laughs> that doesn't cause that. That ends up causing, careful, Mark, you're going to drip and ask it for Kleenex. And <laughs> so be careful. All right, so uh, coming to Jerusalem for the purpose of worship, these three feasts, right? Coming to worship the Lord. And they're coming from all over the land of Israel. So we had seen that uh, formerly Israel was experiencing disunity. There was infighting. There was civil war most recently between David, the house of David, and the house of Saul. So finally, when David comes and is anointed king in Jerusalem, or anointed king, and then makes Jerusalem his the capital, and he's king over all of Israel, he then unites, or unifies, is a better term, because they were, it was already a unity, or they are already united in the sense that all 12 tribes were in Israel. But he's bringing unity to the tribes. Remember, David here is representing Jesus bringing unity 
to those who are the household of faith. So when he's saying pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the majority of Israelites, they weren't living in Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem represented the, uh, the focal point of their worship. Do you remember when Daniel was in Babylon? What did he do? We read about it in Daniel chapter 6. They tried to trap him and frame him that nobody could, nobody was to pray to any god except for king, remember the king's Darius. name? Darius, for 30 days. But what did Daniel do? Or open his windows towards Jerusalem. Open his windows toward Jerusalem. Even though at that point, Jerusalem was a devastated city. Oh, pardon me? I guess that's better than destroy. <laughs> devastated. It was still around. But. It was still around, but it, yeah, it was destroyed. I mean, the walls were, were fallen. The uh, temple was decimated. It was, it was fallen as well. And uh, only uh, a few people were living in the region, relatively speaking. And Daniel, he's opening his windows toward Jerusalem. I wonder if he prayed this, Psalm 122. I wonder if he was praying for the peace of Jerusalem, even though it's now ex experiencing anything but peace. See, what they were, what David is, is summarizing here is there's something more than just Jerusalem experiencing peace. Because what is it that Jerusalem represents? The very dwelling place of God, and as the result of or, or um, yeah, I guess as the result of God's presence in Jerusalem, what does that bring to the rest of the nation? David brought about unification, right? Brings about peace. If there's peace in Jerusalem, there can be expectation that there will be peace throughout the land. Yes. Can that be understood for this time? mentioned Daniel for us now pointing to the time of the new Jerusalem is that not is that not what to pray for that time of peace in Jerusalem that's really the only time going to be peace. that's the only time there's going to be peace but yes yeah, so you're right there's going to be that aspect so, but, so when it says pray for the peace of Jerusalem is that what the only aspect for us today But that's the only time there's going to be peace. Well, not, not necessarily the new Jerusalem, but the thousand-year rule, thousand rule and reign of Christ. When he rules in Jerusalem, because he's going to bring peace in the th in, during his reign. So during that thousand years, there's going to be reign. And then at the end of his rule, his thousand-year rule and reign, all his enemies will be made his footstool. And then... Um, all of the enemies of, of Jesus will be then thrown into the lake of fire. The last enemy to be destroyed will be death. death. Then there will be the new heavens and the new earth. And then coming down to earth will be the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem, yeah. And uh, that will be now the eternal kingdom. In other words, from that point on, the home, the dwelling of righteousness, no more sin, sickness, sorrow, tears, death. It's like heaven is literally on earth. Yeah, because and we read in Revelation 22 that and when that takes place and the dwelling of God is with men. So yeah, it is. It'll be heaven on earth. Uh, there'll be a taste of heaven on earth during the thousand year rule and reign but there will not be the elimination of sin. But there will be a reign of the righteous one but there still will be sin to a certain degree but in a much less realized uh, way than what we see today because the world is going to be <laughs> yeah subdued in a, in a huge sense because the enemies of Christ uh, at the beginning of his reign when he comes his enemies of Christ are going to be destroyed so there's going to be a righteous reign for the first uh, several years and then as new people are born into this kingdom, 
by those who had survived the tribulation, then they will go up to decide either to follow Christ or to rebel against him. And at the end of a thousand years, that's when the, the devil will be released, Satan will be released from the bottomless pit, and he will attempt to uh, stir up this rebellion against Jesus, but then it'll be put down immediately, and then they will be judged, cast into the lake of fire. Will people die? Or will they live like, for a thousand years? Uh, they will live for a thousand years, although Isaiah says that the, some, uh, anyone who dies at a hundred years of age will be considered to be a mere child. So it seems to indicate that those who, who live walk out in blatant rebellion, that there will be judgment upon them and so, there will be some death. So death is not taken away during yeah, the, the millennial funny. reign. It, yeah. It's after, so it makes you think it's during Christ's thousand reign. Yeah, so it indicates one who dies at a, a hundred years of age will be considered a mere youth. Uh, and the ones that will be that will experience death at that time seems to imply those who are outright rebellious against Jesus, against his reign. Uh, we can pray for the peace of Jerusalem right now, like literally for Jerusalem, for its peace. Uh, there's a lot of conflict that Jerusalem experiences and the entire nation, because as Jerusalem goes, so goes Israel, the rest of the nation. So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to be looking at this in just a, a very short time as we deal, deal with this, that praying for the peace of Jerusalem is recognizing that Jesus is the one who fulfills this role in the body of Christ. Because he's the head of the church, isn't he? He's the one who unifies the church, brings us together. So when we see praying for the peace of Jerusalem, it's where the presence of God is manifest. Where's the presence of God made manifest today? It's the church, the body of Christ. So may they be secure who love you. It's not just a matter of, oh, I love Jerusalem. It's such a nice city. It's loving Jerusalem because that is the dwelling place. At that time, it was what was represented or recognized as the dwelling place of God. Speaks about, um, so peace. What is the word for peace in uh, shalom? So we see it a, a few different ways spoken about for us. First of all, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. All right, so what, is, what does the name Jerusalem mean? What is it? Founded peaceful. Founded peaceful. So uh, there's this sense that Jerusalem, the city, was founded with what is peaceful. It's, it's more than just an absence of conflict. It speaks of completeness. It speaks of wholeness. So this uh, word, uh, Salem, uh, It's, it's where the root word, it's the root word for, we get the word shalom, for peace. And so when you look in the lexicon, for instance, the Hebrew lexicon, you'll see shalom, and then it'll say it comes from the root word of shalem. Uh, excuse me, not shalem, shalom. So that's shalom there. The root word for peace. Uh, yara, or in, in Hebrew, there's no J, it's, it would be Ya. In English, we get the, the Ja aspect, so it would be Yara. So Yara also has this idea of flow, flow like a river. Um, so a flowing, a flow of, of wholeness or peace or that which is completeness. Really what it says, the way of completeness, or the way of peace. So it's founded, it's a city that's founded as peaceful, but it's a flow of peace. Indicating that that which we see 
established in Jerusalem. Where, where's the first time we see Jerusalem, by the way, in Scripture? What is it? Genesis 14. Genesis 14. In what context? Abraham meets Melchizedek, king of Salem, and he's also referred to as king of righteousness, king of peace. The king of righteousness because Melchizedek, Melech is king, Sedek is righteousness, king of righteousness, and then he's king of Salem, which is, we've already seen, Shalah, Salem, is peace, king of peace. And Jesus, in Psalm 110, we, we see that he is uh, a king, or excuse me, he's, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we see that over and over again in uh, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 5, 6, 7, especially speak of Melchizedek over and over again, uh, and that Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek, even as I swore by an oath that you are established as a priest forever after this order of Melchizedek. King of righteousness, king of peace. So the first time we see Jerusalem is with, associated with Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of peace. And now with David, we see that um, Jerusalem is associated with the presence of God because the Ark of the Covenant has come to Jerusalem, established in the tent of David, and David representing Messiah. Of course, the one who will be king. Jesus, the king of righteousness, king of peace, the one who dwells in the midst of the church. He's the, he's the head of of the church, even as Ephesians chapter 1 speaks about him. That he is head over all, even the church. But when he says here in verse 7, peace be within your walls and security within your towers. There's uh, a play on words here when it speaks about security. It's that word again, shalom. So we see peace within your walls, shalom, security within your walls, shalom, for what purpose? For my brothers and companions' sake. I will say peace within you. What is, why is it for the sake of his brothers and companions? Because there's a unity as a result of the peace of Jerusalem. And then it says, and for the sake of the house of the Lord your God, I will seek your good, but it's also speaking about this idea that peace for the sake of the Lord our God, because it's all about his glory, right? And I will speak, I will seek your good. Uh, I think other translations might have, I will seek your um, prosperity. prosperity. Yeah, but the word is literally tov. Tov is what you would see, especially in Genesis chapter one. The Lord saw that it was Good, tov. There was evening in the morning, and there was morning the first day. There was evening in the morning the second day. God saw that it was good, tov. Same word that's being used here. I will seek your tov. I will seek your good. So I'll seek the good of, how do you spell, how do you spell tov? T-O-V. Yeah, T-O-V. I'll seek your good. Now, we're seeing peace, unity uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Remember that this is a song of ascent written by David. He doesn't write all of these songs of ascent, but he's written this one. He writes uh, 124. He also writes 131, I think it is, and 133. Now, we're not going to take time to look at all of those this evening, that's not the scope of our study. But I do want us to go ahead to Psalm 133, the second last of the Psalms of Ascent, and it's the, one, the last one written by David. So keeping in mind this idea of Jerusalem, peace that's, that's uh, associated with it, the presence of God, his name is placed there. 
that there's this unity amongst his brothers and companions. So he's not just talking about his family members. He's talking about the entire community, but not just the community of Jerusalem, the entire nation from Dan in the north to Yeshiva in the south. So, uh, since I have this, he's speaking from right up here in Dan in the north, right down to Beersheba. Beersheba is right here. Beersheba in the south. All the entire land of Israel. Bringing them together. And I will seek your good for the sake of the house of the Lord our God. Not just for the sake of our God, but the sake of the house. House speaks of the dwelling place of God. Of course, we are being built up. The church is being built up as a, Peter speaks about it, living stones built up into it. What kind of a house? What is it? A holy temple. Okay, we are built up as a holy temple. Peter uses the phrase in 2 Peter 2, uh, second, first Peter. First Peter two, he says that we are being we are um, we are be, being uh, built together as living stones into a spiritual house, which is the which is a temple. Pardon me. Uh, yeah, Peter refers to it there as a spiritual house. All right. With that in mind, come with me to Psalm. 133. And let's read that together. And we are at Melissa, are we? Yes. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his it is as if the dew of Hermon was falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessings to his life forevermore. All right. What, what is the purpose of this? What, what is he saying? Well, he's talking about brothers dwelling together in unity. But then he likens it to oil being poured on the head, flowing down the beard, but not just any beard. On whose beard? Aaron. Aaron's beard, but not just down the beard, but even onto his robe. His robe. Uh, and, and then he likens it to the dew of Hermon, Hermon, Mount Hermon. Falls on the mountains of, which is Jerusalem, mountain of God. Uh, for the Lord has commanded his blessing there, life forevermore. What does that mean? Why does, he, why does he bring Aaron into this? Why does he speak about Hermon, uh, the dew of Hermon? Aaron was the first high priest that was anointed by God. All right, he's the first high priest. So, you're right. So I'm asking the question further. So, so what? Why does he bring Aaron into this, the first high priest? It's a special time, I don't know. <laughs> All right, when they was consecrated, they poured oil over him. Let's have a look at our screen for a moment. Here is a depiction of Moses. Uh, you're going to be here. You go. All right. Now, this is spoken about for us in Exodus chapter 29, and then also in Leviticus chapter 8. So I'll, I'll write that on the board so you have it for your reference. Exodus 29, verses 1 to 9, <coughs> Leviticus, I'm just abbreviating it here, uh, chapter 8, and verses 5 to 13, and then again to uh, 22 to 30. All right, so what? Well, first of all, uh, there's... There's one thing wrong with this picture. Anybody know what it is? It was the best picture I could find, but it's still not satisfactory as far as I'm concerned. 
Let's go to the next screen. It's just a close up of Moses and Aaron. Uh, okay, well, well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. He's getting ready to anoint him. Okay. Uh, but what's, what's wrong with this picture? What, what should be where Moses' hands are? All right. What is on Aaron's lap should be on his head. It's the mitre uh, that the Lord had said was part of his garments. And anybody know what was on the front part of that turban, or that mitre? Holy to the Lord. Holy to the Lord. It was a gold plate that was engraved and said, Holy to the Lord. So Moses then would uh, take the oil, something like this, a horn of oil, something like this, a horn, uh, referred to as a shofar, a horn, a ram's horn, and it would be stopped, there'd be a, a like a wax stopper on this end, and then uh, there would be a sling, rope, a string or something like that that would be put around it so you could be carried, possibly, along around the shoulders. And uh, there would be some type of a, of a cap or covering on this. Now, uh, this would be filled with oil. So when you hear a horn of oil, that's what this is referring to. Horn of oil, and then uh, as you see here the uh, depicted, that horn of oil then would be um, there we go, poured on the head of Aaron. But his turban, his mitre, would be in place. You can put that one. Not after. No. The anointing go the oil is poured on his mitre. It's not just his head, it's also on his mitre. Because it's upon his garments that are being covered with the oil. Now you have been anointed with oil in the past and somebody's prayed with you. It's myself or somebody else, perhaps on a Sunday service, and we would say, okay, anyone in need of prayer and then uh, for healing? And then we would take this, and, and how would it be applied? Okay. It would be a little dab, and uh, it might be just dabbed on there. It could be in the form of a cross, but it doesn't need to be in the form of a cross. It's just... <coughs> To anoint simply means to anoint. It means, literally <laughs> means to smear. Anoint means to smear or to apply. Now, uh, ladies, if you were to be anointed and then I took this and you said, all right, uh, yeah, I need prayer, I need healing. And you say, would you anoint me with oil and pray? And I took this amount and I just went <laughs> on your head. And I didn't stop until it was empty. How many of you are going to be like, oh, okay, let's pray now. <laughs> or how many of you are going to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> like backing away. Uh, guys, you're going to be probably going to do the same, right? How many of us are going to be like, what, what happened to you just to dab? The dabbing. But our culture doesn't do that. All right. Uh, they literally would take that horn of oil and would pour it on the head. Now, a little dab will do you. I knew that was coming. <laughs> you started it. Yes, I did. <laughs> a little dab is, um, is what we're used to. But when we think of anointing with oil, we think of a little dab, a little amount. And when we do, we look, okay, it's like precious oil on the head running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron. Well, if, if this is just dabbed, it's not running down the face, let alone down the beard, if somebody had a beard. Notice it says running down the beard, even the beard of Aaron. It's not, a, it's not, not talking about any old beard. It's talking about somebody's beard specifically. Aaron's beard, and we talked about it being the high priest. All right. Not only is it running down his beard, but it's running down on the 
collar of his robes. That's the word that is being used here for collar, that's being translated into English as collar. Anybody know what this word means? It says? Wow. Oh. Getting smart. <laughs> So that word is the word pay, and it means mouth. The mouth of a garment could refer to one of two parts of the, of the garment, right? So I have a sweater on. What is the mouth of this garment, of this sweater? The neck or the, the bottom, the waist? My opinion is collar is not an accurate description of pay. I believe it's the bottom part of his garments, but his garment is not a sweater. His garment is, well, let's, let's have a look at the next one. His garment goes right down to his lower calf or to his ankles. So that the bottom of that would be referred to as the pay. A mouth as well. Some translations refer to this running down on the beard of Aaron, uh, running down on his skirt, so down to the bottom part of his skirt. Now, why do I believe it's the bottom part of his garment and not the top part? The bottom part usually has thingy around it. <laughs> thingy. <laughs> thingy. Yeah. No, um... Th thingy is a, uh, is a female word I've learned over the years. When, when somebody doesn't, when a lady doesn't know what it's called, it's, it's, become, it's this universal term. It's a thingy. And, and what I've learned is that other ladies know exactly what that thingy is. Right? You know what she's talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what she's talking about? Kind of? Yeah. All right. Yes, the hem. The hem. With, with the... Hell. Yes. There you go. See? Thingies. Thingy. It's, it's female code. I don't understand it. But anyway. Yes, sir. The hem is male, actually. It's a curve. It's the second one. Bottom. E. Pay. Pay. Because that's where you get in and get out of it. <laughs> yeah. That's the mouth. You, can't you, you, you go in the opening, right? <laughs> Makes sense. The other reason for it is what it's likened unto. It says, it's like oil being poured on the head, running down the beard, even the beard of Aaron, onto the mouth of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon. So it likens, so it takes the garments of the high priest, the high priest himself, and Aaron being the prototype of of the high priesthood, no matter who the priest is at the time, but he's the archetype, that's the prototype, the archetypal um, high priest. And uh, when it's likened then or compared to, to Hermon, go, flowing down uh, the dew of Hermon, even going down to the uh, mountains of Zion, we see the same picture given to us there. You see it? How? How do you see the correlation between the two? It's going way up north and down. Okay. So it's not just a little way, it's not just down to the sea of Galilee. It's not it's just around the collar at the base of Hermon. So let me show you this. Plus the anointing would, oil would go all over because his whole garment was, was consecrated. So the ephod and the, and the linen part. Yeah, everything is being anointed. Everything is being covered. So that when the priest goes about his duties, his ministry, every day, and he's putting on this garment, what is visible when he puts it on? What's a reminder to him? This is consecrated. This is set apart. And that much oil is not going to stop at your neck. Right? <laughs> okay, flowing down on the head, down the beard, even the beard of Aaron, even to the collar. It's like, okay, was he, was he wearing some kind of a... Uh, Catch basin? Was he wearing like a like a hairdresser's cape? His beard. How old is Aaron? When he's high priest, becomes high priest, how old is he? 
90? Very close to it. He's only 100. No. No, he's 80. How much older than Moses was Aaron? He's three years older than Moses. Moses is... 83 when Aaron, when Aaron was 83 when Moses was 80. And they were probably in... It was yeah, probably a year, year later yeah. this happened, so he was maybe. So, and then I had a year on from the time they went back to Egypt and for all of the plagues to take place. So upwards of a year in Egypt for all of the plagues to take place. And then by the time they get to uh, Sinai and then the tabernacle to be constructed, which is about a, close to another year. So I had two years on top of the 83. He's about 85 years of age. Um, now, they didn't cut their beards. It doesn't take long for somebody who's able to grow a beard for that beard to get some kind of length to it, right? So flowing down the beard. Then <laughs> my wife hates beards. <laughs> and she's got this face, just <laughs> long beards. Just yeah, no offense if you've got a long beard. She just she's not a fan. And uh, that's why I don't have a beard. Okay, so, uh, yeah, down the garments of Aaron. So, let's have a look at our screen. This is the Sea of Galilee. In the background, looking north, is Mount Hermon. All right, now let's look at our next screen. This is a map. The Galilee, you see Mount Hermon here. And then it says like the dew of Hermon. So it's like the dew of Hermon, which falls where? On the mountains of Zion. Well, where's Zion? It's not right here. It's not even at Galilee. It's not even just below Galilee. Here is a fuller map of Israel. Here is now Mount Hermon at the very north. So you can click that. So Mount Hermon is at the north and then you see that the Jordan River flows down from Hermon and it comes into the Sea of Galilee and then continues at the uh, southern exit of the Sea of Galilee and it flows down to the Dead Sea. And uh, this is somewhat poetic language that is being used here as it goes from Hermon and flows to the rest of the country. It brings about life along its entire banks. It brings refreshing. If it wasn't for Hermon, would there be a Jordan? Not probably not. It would be just take probably out of there. Not. Not. <laughs> yeah, there would not be a Jordan without Hermon. For example, Hermon got a bunch of snow this weekend. The Sea of Galilee went up a few centimeters in height. Oh, and uh, down a mountain, goes right into the sea. There's Zion. All right, Mount Zion. So it's it's at a parallel level with where the Jordan enters into the Dead Sea. So you notice uh, Mount Zion, it's not near the top part of Hermon. In a sense, it's down uh, by the skirts, the bottom, pardon me? Close to the feet, in a sense, all right? That's the kind of picture that's going on, that's being given to us here. When we, when we think about this, the, the last portion that he says, for there, for where? When he says, for there, where is there? Mount Zion. Mount Zion or Jerusalem, uh, even more than that. So yeah, it's Jerusalem, it's Mount Zion, but even uh, more than that, what is he speaking about? Unity. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. For there, where? 
in unity. For there, in unity, the Lord commands the what? His blessing. The blessing of what? Life. How long? Forevermore. Forevermore. Uh, remember what it says uh, in this last verse, for there. Do you remember the word there? We've seen that back in Psalm 122 twice, and then the play on that word of, of shame, and then connected to the word shem, which is the name. Hashem means the name. That's one of the names of the Lord. Jewish people would refer to the Lord as Adonai or Elohim. Uh, they would refer to him as Hashem, the name. There the Lord commands his blessing. How is unity brought about? How do brothers dwell together in unity? It's because of the name. They're dwelling, they are dwelling there in the name. See, the picture of the priest, the high priest, is Jesus our high priest? And we've already looked at it, that he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So over and over again, we're seeing this picture that Jesus is the one by which, through whom, we have, and only the only way we can have unity. So he's a picture of, or he's pictured by the high priest. And the unity that is brought about in this dwelling place where he's determined, or he is determined, uh, spoken that he would um, place his name. So it's Jerusalem, the city that is called by his name. Where is, what is called by his name now? Church. We are called by his name. <coughs> and Israel itself, it's, the Lord didn't choose Israel just because, oh, you know, easy to get easy to take over. The land itself is a very picture of the, the ministry of, of the Lord, the, the way the, 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 way that the um, country, the topography, the geography works is even a picture, even as is given to us here in verse 3. So many lessons from the land that we don't have time to get into it tonight, so I'm going to leave that at that place. Now, uh, let's consider this for another moment regarding Jesus being pictured here. Come back to our screen. So we've got Mount Hermon. We're going to show it, I'll show it here just so that we have uh, something that's kind of tangible, tactile for us. We have Hermon is right here, at the very top of the, the country. What happens right here in Jesus' day? In Matthew chapter 17. Have I given enough hints as to what's, what goes on in Matthew chapter 17, Mark chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9? Transfigured. Jesus was transfigured on a, I think it was Mark, he says, on a high mountain. Mount Hermon is the only mountain that could be referred to as a high mountain. There's other mountains that are they're decent altitude, but Hermon is twice as high as any other mountain in Israel. At least twice as high. So he's, he goes up on the mountain, a high mountain, Mount Hermon. He's transfigured before them. The transfiguring of Jesus, what uh, takes place at the transfiguring? What happens to his garments? So they become whiter than, than any launderer could get it. It becomes white like the, or bright as the sun. The high priest garments, when he goes into the most holy place on the day of atonement, he doesn't wear all of the rest of the stuff that was pictured for us uh, in those garments. And I don't think I put just his linen ephod. It's this white part of the garment 
right here. This is what, not just white sleeves. These are layers. There's a white garment, and then there's the, uh, pardon me? Oh, you can see the white on the bottom. Yeah, so this is, this is a, uh, like a robe, a white robe. And then over it would be the blue ephod, and then there'd be the, the um, multicolored uh, ephod that's over that, and then the breast uh, plate that's on top, that's attached to that. So on the Day of Atonement, when he goes into the most holy place, the only thing he wears is white garments, white linen. I'm curious. Can't prove it. I, I don't know that this is the case, but I wonder if the priests, when they're ministering before the Lord at the tent of David, if it's the white linen garment that they're wearing, because they now have access to the presence of God. And here Jesus. And David wore just a linen ephod. David wore just a linen ephod. So as they are, as he's, as the procession is taking place, he's wearing a white ephod like the rest of the priests would be wearing. And so what would they be wearing as they minister before the Ark of the Covenant? Well, it stands to reason that they would be wearing white ephods, white linen garments, these robes. Here Jesus is presented to the three, which three? Peter, James and, John. James and John. Then they go down the mountain and they come to a place called, in Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus says that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What's the name of that place? Caesarea Philippi, which is located... Do I have it on this one? Let me see, is it the next one? Here we are. All right, we've got the arrow. Just another click. That's, oh, that's, no, that's Mount Hermon. Yeah, that's Mount Hermon and just at the base. No, oh, that's not it. All right, but it's right at the base. So I'm gonna give it to you here. Let's see if I can come. It's right here. So at the base of Mount Hermon, yes is Caesarea Philippi, which happens in the very next chapter. Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? They give a bunch of different things. They say this, they say that, Jeremiah, or maybe one of the prophets, or the prophet. Uh, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Let's stop there just for a second. You are the what? Christ. What is another word for Christ? Messiah. It's another word for, so Meshach, Meshach. Um, or, excuse me, Mashiach. Meshach is anoint. Uh, so that's the verb. Mashiach. No, it's all right. Mashiach is anointed or anointed one. Uh, and so that refers to king in this instance and the priest. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. And um, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you this, verily, or amen. Upon this rock, I will build my church. How is he building this church? He's uniting, unifying the church. Not a bunch of individuals that are just here and there scattered about. The church is brought together in a unity. On this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And here we are 2,000 years later and the, those gates of hell have not prevailed against the church. The church continues to advance. Life, is the, there the Lord is commanded as the blessing in unity. Well, it's not unity as an abstract thing. It's unity that can only be found in Jesus, Hashem, the name. Life forevermore.
So that's the songs of ascent so far as they're related to David that are uh, pertinent to what we've been looking at here back in 2 Samuel chapters 7, 8, uh, 8, 9, and 10, and then 1 Chronicles chapters um, 16, 17, 18. Um, and 19. Remember David, he was subduing his enemies in those passages, in those chapters. Subduing his enemies. It's a picture of Jesus bringing, um, subduing to, to the nation or to, the, to our enemies, uniting the church, unifying us in him who is the head over all things. He's the anointed one. He's the anointed king. He's the anointed priest who is over all. All right, let's come back to 1 Chronicles. Um, before we do that, before we look at Chronicles, just consider Jesus for a moment. That when in his high priestly prayer, as it's called, in John chapter 17, he prays, Father, make them, what? One, one as yeah. we are one. You and me, I and you. Uh, I'm fading out in the accuracy of that quote. John 17, in verse 23, uh, 22 and 23, I am them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. He's given us his glory so that we may be one even as the Father and the Son are one. Jesus and us we in, uh, and the Father in him, that we may become perfectly one. This is a work of, the, of our Lord, of our anointed Mashiach. Uh, we saw it a couple of weeks ago, remember the woman at the well? And then Jesus said, it's not going to be on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, which is in this region right here, in Samaria, nor in Jerusalem, which is down more south, neither in these two places. He's bringing unity. He's the unifier and he is the place. He says that uh, he's making us into worshipers, worshiping the worshipers who worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I think I'm going to leave that aspect there because there's there's more that we could deal with, but it's going to be, I think it'll sort of draw us away a little bit. Let's let's continue on looking here at First Chronicles, chapter 20. So it's after he he subdues um, the Philistines, the Ammonites, so Syria, and so on that are being subdued. Now let's come into First Chronicles. We're looking at chapter 20. Short chapter. Lots going on. So let's look at verses 1 through 3 to begin with. In the spring of the year, the time when kings went to battle, Joab led out the army grabbed the country of the Ammonites and came and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Joab struck down Rabbah and overthrew it. David took the crown of the king from his head and found that it weighed 
a pound of gold in it is what? Precious stone. In it was and a in it was a precious stone. And it was placed on David's head. He brought out the spoil of the city a very great amount. He brought out the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and axes. Thus David did to all the cities of the Ammonites. And David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. The chronicler details aspects here that the writer of 2 Samuel doesn't. And he leaves out things that Samuel, this writer of 2 Samuel, puts in. So if you're familiar, if you're familiar at all with the scripture that speaks of uh, what's going on when David remains in Jerusalem and the rest of his army is going out to, um, to Rabbah. We can get hung up on that. Pardon me? The account of Bathsheba? This is the account of Bathsheba. The chronicler doesn't deal with Bathsheba. He doesn't mention her at all. Doesn't mention the situation. Pardon me? Good for him. <laughs> Good for him. But the writer of 2 Samuel does. Now, we're not dealing with 2 Samuel tonight. That'll be next week. But, suffice it to be aware that in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. Now, let me ask you this. Why is it that the kings went to battle in the spring of the year? Winter's too cold. Is that it? Is that all? These men weak? I mean, do we go to battle? Do our... Do our uh, Armies battle in, in the wintertime? Well, yeah. Machines. All right, I have machines, but they had fires. They had means of, of building shelters and fires. Didn't have tanks. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I wouldn't want to be in a tank. They're pretty cold. Why is it spring of the year? It's not just that it's, it's warmer. Why spring of the year? Interrupt the, the farming of the enemy. Uh... In a sense, so you're you're on the right track. And it's not so much to, to do the railroad. <laughs> the railroad. <laughs> it was after yep. the spring harvest. Uh, not necessarily. You have to be throughout the middle of it. So not necessarily after the spring harvest. What goes on in the spring? Love. <laughs> 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 Food begins to grow in the spring, in the field, and in the vineyards, and in the orchards, so that uh, you don't have to carry as much food, you don't have to pack as much coming from home. <laughs> so as you're traveling throughout, uh, you are able to glean from the fields and the trees and so on. So whether it be nuts or fruit, or their, so the dates and figs, um, things of that nature, grains as they're beginning to grow, then they're able to access. The barley harvest. The barley harvest is in April. So numerous things are beginning to grow and, and provisions are now being made available so that they don't have to have a bunch of pack mules in the sense of bringing provisions from home. Because the more you gotta carry, the more difficult it is because you're not going much farther than your food, your nutrition supply is able to be near you. That's why some horses, if they were on retreat, would burn everything so that the ones coming in would have no resources. No resources. Yeah. The other aspect is when we think of winter, we think of when we were there, we think of snow, right? In Israel, for the most part, unless you're in the northern part, Mount Hermon, which gets a couple of months of snow on, on its top, it's 9,000 feet high. So it's sizable altitude. They have, a, they have a ski resort up there, but it's only usable for a couple of months because there's not enough snow year round. There was snow in Jerusalem this week. Three centimeters was supposed to fall today in Jerusalem, but it's rare. It's not often. When we were there three years ago, no snow. 
when we were there five years ago, no snow. And it was warm, right? It was like spring or even better than, I mean, it was coming into the, just coming into the spring, you started to see some of the blossoms on the trees. So it's coming on the end of the winter, but there was still potential for, um, for some snow like they've gotten today because we went at the same time of year. Uh, but it wasn't the cold. It wasn't the snow that was a concern to them. It was the, what happens in the, in the winter in Israel? The rains. The rains are, can be so heavy that to move things around, it gets bogged down. They didn't have paved roads like we have today. What happens when you get uh, ground that's saturated by water? Muddy. You, so anything that's carts or wheels or even even for yourself walking, you got an army that's walking <laughs> in the same spot. What happens when you get a hundred people that passes through that? And then those are coming behind. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just practicality. So everybody signed an agreement. When the rains come, the winter come, comes around, let's stay home. We'll fight in the spring. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So by and large, that's what happened. In the spring of the year when kings went out to war. <coughs> That's why. Okay? Now, we read here in verse, the latter part, the middle part of verse 1, but David what? Remained in Jerusalem. Remained in Jerusalem. Is that wrong? <coughs> or right? <coughs> Or indifferent. Supposed to go out and lead his army. Lead Supposed his to go army. out and lead the army. Uh, one of the psalms, and I'm trying to think of what it is. Um, Twenty, no, sixteen. Pavilion, the pavilion, the king's pavilion. That's sixteen. Twenty-six. Now I've got to come to it. Twenty. Uh, His heart was already heading toward trouble. Because he knew that the men would all be away fighting. He would have opportunity to go track. Uh, I, it's hard to say whether or not he was staying back because he's scheming to, because he already knows Bathsheba's there, or because he's home and now the rains are done, <coughs> where's he going to be? Well, he's well I just meant women in general. Like, All women in general? The men are going to be gone. The women are going to be out doing their spring cleaning. Um, but they'll be out and around. And he will have a visual vantage point from his place over the. Okay. And so if he if his heart is already heading in the direction, he's just making it happen. And she turned out to be the one. Possible. We got to keep in mind that he has a few wives, so he's not he's not uh, suffering for um, intimacy. I would argue that he, he remains home because there's peace, relative peace. Remember, he subdued a number of the nations around him. Joab can take care of it. I'll look after things here. I've been on the run. I've been fighting for the last how many years? Well, a good 10 years from the time that he was anointed until he became king running away from Saul, and then he's been subduing the Philistines, he's been still at this, subduing the Moabites, the uh, et cetera, et cetera, the Ammonites, and the Syrians. And, yeah, so he's been fighting a long time. So, Every guys, spring? pardon? Every spring? You know, springtime, time for war. Seriously, <laughs> in the spring when kings go to war, like, is that a common thing? If there's going to be war, that's when it would begin. That's when, when the campaigns would begin. I mean, it's not like every king is like, okay, it's springtime, or uh, bring on the war games. No, it wasn't that. They said if there was going to be battles, it would begin in the spring, right? When, when kings would 
go to battle. If, there, if there's disputes or whatever, then they would go out to pursue. So it's not like, all right, who can I pick a fight with now? <laughs> it seems like. <laughs> right? <laughs> the way it's written, that's what it sounds like. Pretty cool days. Uh, it's <laughs> Psalm 27. <laughs> it's cool days, okay. <laughs> Psalm 27 and verse 5. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. Uh, just keep me safe in his dwelling. But it's, it's the word pavilion, which uh, is the word... Uh, tabernacle, uh, his, the, the sulke, and it's the place where the king would dwell, which would be in the middle of the camp, and it would be the most fortified area of the army. So basically, the safest place to be on the battlefield would be at the king's pavilion. So, yeah, so he will hide me, the Lord will hide me in, the sh in his shelter, his pavilion, uh, in the day of trouble. He'll conceal me under the cover of his tent. He'll lift me high upon the rock. So pavilion is the, uh, yeah, New King James or King James. So, so the ohel uh, is, the, is the tent or tabernacle that they would come under. The pavilion, the shelter, the ohel, the, the sulke. Sulke. All right? So that's what I was trying to bring to mind. All right, so we're, we are aware that the Bathsheba event takes place while Joab is out looking after um, overthrowing Rabbah. Okay, so now notice something. The chronicler doesn't deal with Bathsheba. He doesn't deal with any of the things that are going on. He doesn't deal with Uriah all those things that are going on in 2 Samuel chapter 11. He's not dealing with any of that. What does he deal with? David's, David didn't go out, so he stayed in Jerusalem. Joab went out and struck down the king of Rabbah, or the, all of them, and then he, David, what did David do? He took the crown of the king. Did he go there to take the crown, or did they return it? The answer is in the text. Okay, that he went there and got the crown. He went there and got the crown, and um, it was placed on David's head. He, he brought out the spoil of the city, and he brought out the people who, went, who were in it and set them to labor with saws, iron picks, and axes. And thus David to, to all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to who, who returned to Jerusalem? David and his entire army. So for a short time, David remained in Jerusalem. Long enough to get himself in trouble that this writer of 2 Samuel deals with. But that's not the focus of the writer of the Chronicle. So that's not our focus just at the moment. Okay? So pretend you don't know anything about Bathsheba. Pretend. Hard to do, but we just, that's not, the writer of Chronicles doesn't deal with it, doesn't address it. He addresses, he focuses on something else. So that's what we need to focus on for the time being, okay? It's portraying David as being victorious. Rest. Continuing on in this uni unity, bringing unity and keeping those that would, that would be, uh, those that would try to raise their, Rebellion against the king, the Mashiach, their rebellions are being quelled, put down, right? Because it's not just to the king of Rabbah, but to all of the, what does he say? Ammonite. So all the Ammonite towns. In other words, the towns that would, would bring trouble, that would bring rebellion. So he went about to bring, uh, continue to subdue those so it's a, it's a picture of, of those areas of the flesh, the, the old man, if you will, that have not submitted fully to the spirit of God, the spirit, spiritual man. Remember, Saul and David are kind of polar opposites. And then we see that the subduing of all of these works or influences of the flesh are quelled, subdued. But they will attempt to rise up. 
David goes out and what does he do? He even showing that he takes the crown off of the head and says, no, 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 this doesn't rightly belong to you. It belongs to me. So he puts it on. It's placed on his head. And it's quite heavy. And then all the people returned to Jerusalem. Well, then there's something that goes on with the Philistines at Gezer. Pardon me? A talent. Yes, and in my pound, but this person. Your head. David must have had a really strong neck. Well, the Queen of England, or her crown, she said if she ever went a certain way, she said, you're going to break her neck. Yeah. It's quite heavy. <laughs> Uh, boy, if I stop here, we're going to be another cliffhanger. Yeah, probably. No, <laughs> but we are at our um, at our end. We're going to finish off the chroniclers. We have. Let's take five minutes and deal with what the chronicler completes. His, his emphasis with at this time frame. And then we'll deal with uh, 2 Samuel 11 and 12 next week. Okay? That, that sound reasonable? Uh, so let's finish looking at verses 4 through no, 8. 4 through 8. In the course of time, war broke out with the Philistines at Giza. At that time, there's uh, various names in here, yes. so why don't we say this guy struck down that guy, yeah. who was one of the one of, big, uh, <laughs> of the giants, or the, what does it say? Rephites. Rep, Rep, and the Philistines were subject, subjugated. In another battle with the Philistines, Elhanah, Elhana, son of Jerah killed Laman, the brother of Goliath, the Jittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. It's still, in still another battle which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Twenty-four in all. He also uh, was a descendant from Rapha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemuel, David's brother, killed him. These were descendants of Rapha and Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. This is speaking about the Philistines. They're still in cahoots with a bunch of men of large stature. So Goliath wasn't the only one. So he had brothers, but that's not in this account. So David's nephew took yeah. out the guy with the six fingers. Oh, so. uh, sorry, is that, sorry, my mistake. Yeah, the brother of Gittite, but there was others. Okay, great. Right, right. Yeah, the, the, I'm the, the last falling no, I'm thinking of something else. The, no, so the last. Yeah. So that's not the Goliath that we Yes, know. yeah, the Gittite. Because Gittite is the one from yeah. Gath. Yeah. Right? Now, um, this is just further picturing of these uprisings, not just in Ammon. Where is Ammon? Right here. Here's Ammon. Okay. Where's Philistines? They're on, uh, they're on this region right here. Okay. So Gath, Gezer, um, Gaza, the Gaza Strip would be that area. Uh, can I say this much? When you talk about the Palestinians and Palestine, incorrect words. So that's that's a Latin name for the Philistines. Philistines. But the Philistines didn't exist in Jesus' day, and the Philistines don't live, exist today. But after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, a few decades later, Rome decided that they were going to obliterate all kinds of rebellion by the Jews, and so they renamed Israel Palestina. 
which is the name, the Latin name for the Philistines. So the Arabs, back uh, the turn of the 20th century, took on this identity of Palestine because they continued to refer to it as Israel as Palestine. The British mandate referred to it as Palestine. If you see maps that refer to Israel as Palestine, it's not correct. Not Palestine, it's Israel. And so the Arabs took on the name Palestinians, and they say that they are descendants of the Philistines, and they are not. Wouldn't matter anyway if it was Right. Anyway, so we just see this further picture that uh, men of great stature who were formidable foes, they were rising up, and we see that David not just in one location taking care of those that were rising up in rebellion or contention against his reign, but wherever the contentions rose up, he went and took care of them, him and his men. That's the emphasis of the chronicler in this respect. So we see the picture of Jesus shown to us in the working of David. Was it wrong for him to stay in Jerusalem? Well, for a time, what's he doing? He's establishing whatever he's doing in his rule and his reign. He sends his men out. Is there anything wrong with sending his men out? Not at all. Did Jesus send his men out? Did he send us out? Yeah. So for a time, he sends them out, and then he says what? I will join you. He comes and joins the battles, and he takes the crowns off of the head of those that are trying to usurp his rule and his reign. But it's not just on the east coast, but he goes, or the, the eastern boundaries, he goes even to the western, southwestern boundaries. Those were the area, the regions where these other nations were. The central part of Israel is where the nation, the tribes were basically uh, had full um, occupancy and reign. And it's that respect, which is the picture of David representing Jesus, subduing and bringing you further unity. And uh, as you see in these uh, subjugations, that's what Jesus does in the body church. Next week, we'll look at the other aspect that the book of the writer of 2 Samuel deals with.